should be a red line here in the middle. What we then did is that the Bitcoin XR World Index that currently consists of 24 different country indices. We then said, let's construct indices that consist of six equally weighted countries. And we do this for all combinations within this, within this constraint of having 24 countries. So we actually ended up with almost 135,000 different equally weighted portfolios. Then we calculated the Sharpe ratio, exactly as we did for the MSI world, over the last 10 years. And then we asked ourselves, so then, and then we plotted this into the distribution. And going back to the last slide, the, the last question is it, is the monopoly justified? Would actually be the case that market capitalization where the limits should be somewhere on the right side. Because what we actually see here is that, and I do know that this is just a sample, it might, look, it might be looking different in a different sample, but surely when more than 70% of the portfolios that were just equal weighted performs better than the traditional MCAP index, there must be something to it. And so we, I know that it's not proof that MCAP is inferior, but it's surely not proof that MCAP is superior to other indexing methods. Now the question is, why is this the case? How can it be that 73% of this very less is simply constructed portfolios perform better? And this is nothing new on the next slide. What we're showing here are the ways of countries and regions in the MSL world over time, beginning in the 1970s. So we can see if we focus on Japan, the bottom, we can see that the way that Japan in the beginning of the 70s in the MSL world index was roughly 5 to 6%. We all know what happened in Japan, we had a big bull market, and the companies started making more money, so fundamental values went up. But what also happened was that the valuations of these, these companies' earnings also skyrocketed. So at the end of 89, uh, at the height of the bubble, of bubble in Japan, Japan had a rate of them in the MSM world of roughly 44%. That was mostly due to the, the very high valuation of that stock market. So, in essence, what I'm trying to say here is that investing in market weighted index will impose a procyclical investment behavior upon yourself. Because, per definition, you will end up overweighting overvalued stocks and underweighting undervalued stocks. And that is one of the main reasons why, why, uh, so why the chart could look like, like this. And this is nothing wrong with it. I mean, it's been, uh, we know this for years. There have been a lot of uh, articles published about this area, but the big difference that we currently see is that for the last one or two years, investors have all of a sudden really started to think about this and really started to care about this issue and ask, this, ask the question that do we really want to invest in such a prospective manner? And we can see here a lot, of, a lot of research institutes doing surveys, there's a lot of articles chasing buzzwords such as smart beta, there are even more buzzwords with premia indexing intelligent beta, prime beta, and so on. And a lot of what has been written over the last years has been focused on what should we call them, what should we call these alternative indices. Uh, also the, the, the most hotly contested question is, are these actively managed funds, or actively active strategies, or are the passive strategies? Our take on it is, it really is quite irrelevant what we call them. Because what we call them has zero impact on the investment outcome. What's important is underlying what, what's behind there. Uh, and that is where we look on the right hand side here, which are some of the characteristics that we believe are for them vital in order to be called an index. We need the market of competitiveness. We cannot call uh, a strategy an index if it invests 80% of the assets in one equity. Uh, we need diversification. High liquidity, transparency, you need to know exactly what the index is doing. And very importantly, the last point, replicability. We need to be able to, every given day of the year, exactly replicate the index and exactly know what we're doing. And if the strategy is doing that, we are more than happy to call it an index. So, also, the last couple of years, there have been a lot of new indexing methods being proposed by. A lot of them coming from the industry, the management industry, but also a lot of them being proposed by academics. And if you read the papers, uh, of course, it, it is a fact that 
All of them are the best ones, all of them are superior to the other ones. There is a this slight bias, I guess. Um, and they're also all different to each other. However, if you dig deeper into their methodologies, you will see that between quite a few of them, there are a lot of similarities. Uh, they're trying to capture the same, say, same characteristics, same risk return factors. And that our research has shown that we can really take all of these <laughs> indices methods that are being proposed out there and as say bucket them into five different beta categories. That's what we call here the beta one to beta five. So if we start from the bottom left, we have beta one, what we call price focused in index methods, where we typically see traditional market cap weighted indexing. But also index methods such as diversity indexing or price index such as the Dow Jones index. Price agnostic, that's nothing else than a fancy word for equal weighting. Fundamental focus, beta 3, we have fundamental indexing, we have GDP weighted indexing, we have return focus, we've talked about minimum variance indexing, uh, minimum variance strategy, sorry, and equal contribution to risk indices, etc. The last one being risk focus. So, we really, a lot of us, I don't know how many indices are really out there, but there are quite a few of them. But our research really shows that you can bucket them into these five different categories. Um, and that really should as I simplify also the process when it comes to then allocating to these indices. Then briefly on the background of the characteristics of these five different beta sources. And we start out with the, with the elephant in the room, market cap weight and indexing of beta one. Based on Great theories coming out of the Chicago, Chicago School, the Chicago University, where Mark Rich, Vicky Fama, Samuelson. And I'm not going to stand up here and contest their theories because they want to have the Nobel prizes. It would be rather foolish to do that. But still, it's always a question when does a theory hold up to the test of reality? And there, there are some, you know, we, and we can dispute the fact that some of these theories are great theories, but they don't really hold up to the test of reality. Sometimes due to the fact that they are reliant upon yeah, certain assumptions that are not really true to what's happening out in the real world. Weights are set in market capitalization, but and again, I'm not here to try and bash market capitalization with the meaning, definitely not, because it has some great advantages. It has the highest capacity of all of them. It's very tax efficient, uh, carries low transaction costs, etc., etc. But we shouldn't forget. You get a positive investment behavior when you invest in market cap weighted indexing. Second out is the price agnostic or the equal weighted approach. And here we could even make the point that this is perhaps the true passive approach due to the fact that no information whatsoever regarding prices, fundamental data, etc., are entering the index construction process. It's just a very, very simple, simple method where we are saying we get everything in equal weight. And I think that is, uh, let's say, the beauty of it. However, there is also a flip side to it. And that comes down to the robustness, robustness of such an index. If we take the example of, for instance, S&P 100 and S&P 500. The market cap weighted versions of these two indices, we have very much the same risk return characteristics. However, if we take the equal weighted versions of them, you will see that you don't have the robustness anymore. So you are reliant upon the rather arbitrary choice of how many index constituents do you include in your index. So at first, first sight, for us, it looks compelling, but the closer we look upon it, we got to say now equal weight is not really yeah, a very strong in index. Next one is what we like to call the rock star in the indexing scene, fundamental indexing. Here we have research affiliates, rough indices. Rob Barnett has been doing a lot to promote alternative indexing. Basic idea here is that these indices cut out pricing errors when they construct the indices. So instead of looking at the price, they look at the absolute values of fundamental data. Could be, for instance, the book value, could be earnings, could be dividend yield. So the higher, for instance, the higher the book value, the higher the weight in the index. So clearly we see some. Uh, you see some improvement relative to the MCAP index in the sense that you, you really reduce your cyclicality and you also have a slightly value bias. But, well, that depends on if you want to have it or not, but that is quite often what you get when you run fundamental indexing portfolios. 
Grid focus is the last one, uh, sorry, the second to last one, and uh, one of them being minimal variance indices. The basic rationale behind these indices is that returns are very hard to estimate. <coughs> so let's just focus on risk. And it could be a minimal variance index, where we try and minimize the risk of a portfolio. It could be an equal contribution to risk portfolio, where we just have an equal contribution of the risk in the factors. But it could also be uh, coming out from NEC and toll banks or from maximum diversification portfolios. And um, the basic idea here is really that you're trying to focus solely on risk. And when you do that and you set the indices, you're reliant upon an optimization procedure, more or less all of the time. And I think that is probably also one of the disadvantages with this index approach that you. So that, the index construction process is only as good as the underlying samples that you need to make. You need to make put in restrictions, maximum weight, minimum weight, weights, uh, constraint weight, etc., etc. But surely uh, it's a good approach, and it has gotten a lot of attention over the last couple of years, especially. I think at the end of the day, I think that's the fun thing about it because they should really, these are indexing methods that really focus on risk. But as they have performed quite well on a relative basis over the last couple of years, they have attracted a lot of uh, attention, but I guess almost for the wrong reason, because we shouldn't be chasing return when we focus on risk focus in these methods. The last one out is return focused. Here is all about return, trying to uh, optimize the long term return. Uh, so, Ruben was talking about these different alpha sources. And uh, here we can construct indices that are based on um, the idea of trying to catch anomalies in the market. It could be a high dividend yield index, it could be having an index with small cap yield, etc. etc. Uh, and what we have seen, of, seen here is that quite a few of the other strategies, as far as beta, beta categories are based on is the Chicago School. Here we more rely upon a theory that's called the of rational beliefs. I'm not going to go into detail about it, but I just wanted to briefly mention it because I believe this is a theory that's going to yeah, gain more and more attention over the next couple of years. So, at the end of the day, um, that was the theoretical part. Uh, we talked about the fact that there is a monopoly in the indexing scene. MCAP investing is the holy, by many considered the holy grail. However, we believe that there is potentially another holy grail out there. And the second part of the um, this speech is going to go out for the hunt for this holy grail. And um, when we do that, the, um, what we want to look at right now is a study that we published. I uh, made reference to it at the beginning, a paper that we published last year, uh, where we said we've been reading all of these new, these these papers being brought out by all these index providers or academics. And somehow they all seem to be the best one. And it would be nice to really conduct them in sort of, let's call the apples to apples comparison, where we really have an objective data set that we can work with, and then really try and draw conclusions from that sample. So what we did is that we collected data going back to 1970, and applied that for the MSI World Index. And what we then did is that we replicated 12 of these different index methods from scratch using the exact same methodology as all of these index providers are applying. Uh, so that was the, the, the basic idea, and by doing that, we could then take let's say, the theoretical part of the test of reality and see what does it look like. And the first dimension that we look at is for sure return, just the MFA, we need return in our portfolios. And what we see here is that first thing you have done, they, they seem to always move in the same direction. Which is also holds true, which and also it's not a bad thing. But that also shows that all of these beta categories actually carry the trait of mark representativeness. However, what we also see is that at the end of the day, there's quite a big gap between the you know, high performing and the low performing. Because you have on the top, we have the the return focus in these methods, delivering on, delivering on the promise, achieving the highest long-term return. And what we also see here at the bottom, that the two that they are quite aligned here, it's beta one, beta three. That MCAP index also in this sample 
that's what we may show to yeah, be the best, you know, the highest performing indexing method. But risk, yeah, sorry, return is only one dimension. Risk is the second dimension. Here we ask look at the SAP sample of some risk method that we calculated for this study. And what we see here is that, yes, there is definitely some differences to the risk numbers. Some of the beta categories carry higher volatility, some of them better drawn characteristics, etc., etc. But at the end of the day, it, it's not a huge difference here. But the important thing here is that this, this is based on 40 years of data. And I think despite the fact that many of us probably should have an investment horizon of 40 years, I think probably none of us really live in a world where we really can say that we are having an investment horizon of 40 years or higher. So the next dimension that we need to look at is market cycles. How do they perform in different market cycles? What we did here is just we looked at how did they perform in the aftermath of the team in the, in the moderator process, and now in the credit crisis. And what we can see here, for instance, beta 1 performed pretty weak in the aftermath of the um, TMT, TMT bubble, but it performed quite well in the latest credit crisis. Et cetera, et cetera. And the interesting fact here is that we need to look upon what is driving this return. And then we can see each of these index methods, the beta categories, are trying to exploit targeted risk return factors. Here we can the output of the TMT bubble. Large cap performed pretty weakly because a lot of the large cap were high low value stocks in the, that had gained a lot during the, uh, during the, the IP bubble. Whereas here, in the latest crisis here, large cap were in vogue again because all of a sudden you got, uh, you got paid for sitting on good liquidity, high capacity, etc. etc. So we definitely look at, need to look at market cycles again. And just to take it to, to, let's say, one step further is this is looking at last year and looking at some of the, these indices. And what we see on the side is are the relative returns versus the peer group. So if you come according to your peer group, you agree on this zero line. And what we also see here is if you just take the blue line here, continue on the minimum volatility index, beginning of the year, significantly underperformed. Then you had a very strong rebound, but then it started going down again. So, we can really see that also on an intra-year basis, we see a lot of relative volatility of these indices. So then coming back to the, let's say the, the question again, which one is the holy grail, which one is the winner out there? And that's really the, 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 the bad news. The bad news for us is that there is not one single index method that is superior in all aspects, all market environments. So unfortunately I cannot say for the next 10 years we're going to focus on that one. However, I, I guess I wouldn't be standing here if there wouldn't be any good news. And the good news is, show me the next slide. That ties back to the subtitle, Why Was Diversification Forgotten? It also ties back to what we talked about before in the beta 1, we mentioned Markowitz and Sharp. And here it, it is the case that it seems, seems to be the fact that, despite the fact that, as I said before, the theories of Markowitz and Sharp, which are great, but not necessarily hold up to the test of reality, it, it looks like they want on, onto something anyway. What we see on this slide is the shock ratio for the assembly period, and the MPEG index is down to the bottom left here. And what we then did is that we said, yes, let's start diversify out of MCAP. It doesn't mean getting rid of MCAP, but it just means not having 100% of your index money invested in MCAP. So as we go along here the horizontal axis, we gradually increase the diversification to all of the other beta categories as well. So we end up here on the upper right, right with a perfectly diversified portfolio across all beta categories. So we can really see here, and this is the good news is that the holy grail is diversification, which might be a bit boring because it would be great perhaps to say that minimum variance is going to be the, the new holy grail or diversity is going to be the whole, new holy grail. For us, it's not going to be the case because they all tend to perform differently in different market environments. That is why we should really also start focusing on diversification in when we allocate two, two uh, indices. And this, I mean, this is not something new. Uh, again, make a reference to how we allocate to equity managed funds. I think none of you have allocated all your equity exposure to one equity managed funds. 
but I guess many of you have allocated all your indexing money to one single, single uh, MCAT based strategy. And for us, the question is because we really believe that diversification is true. It is common sense, it's, pretty, it's a basic thing to do, it's not groundbreaking, but we really should apply it here as well. And then the question is how do we apply it in the indexing space? And, might be many ways to do it. We believe that there are two main things to do it. First thing would be to go out there and to say, doing it the, the fund of index things, fund setup, where we go out and buy different kinds of indices from different kinds of providers. Or the second part would be that you follow an integrated approach where you say, I want to create one index that, has, that carries the characteristics of a diversified investment into many many indices, which then as it diversifies across many different risk return factors. And then, so coming back to this slide again at the beginning, uh, <coughs> what will the pie chart look like in 2020? I don't, have the, the, I don't have the crystal balls, I do not know, but I'm pretty sure that it's going to look differently, different in, uh, in a couple of years' time. And Again, it's not the case of getting rid of MCAT, absolutely not, because MCAT should be a part of index investing, but it should not be the only part. So, yes, as the last point to make, to be, make it perhaps even less abstract, how could then such a, let's say, a dynamic approach to indexing look like? First, this is MSL World Cap Weighted, uh, looks like this now. Oh, destroy the surprise. <laughs> uh, on the left side, and then taking this approach that we talked about, integrated approach, that is what we are doing at 1741 as management. Because, as I said before, we're not only doing research, we're going to pay for the research as well. Uh, could look like something like that. Looks like that today. And here, the main point is not exactly where we are allocated. There are two points to make here. One point is diversification. We could compare it with the MCAT and the diversified approach to investing to indices. It truly looks like we are more diversified in this area than we are here. And the second point that we don't see on this slide, that is, but is very, very important, that is, if we were to look at these two pie charts in a year's time, left hand side would more or less look identical. It's very much as a static weighting. On the right hand side, we would see different allocations to different countries because in a year's time we're going to have a different market environment, and then you need to adjust you're waiting to put all your reporting as well. So, I think that was the wrap up. I hope we have, uh, have uh, um, raised some interest and hopefully also some awareness about the industry space. It is in, has been, let's say, a very boring place to invest for the last uh, 30, 40 years. But uh, there is really a revolution going on and it's getting more and more interesting. And the last point to make is uh, make made reference to the paper a couple of times. If anybody are interested to have a copy of it, we've got copies downstairs. And if anybody wants to discuss it in detail, we're more than happy to do it. But this is our library, this is what we have to do. So that thank, was you. All. thank you. Thank you. So before uh, taking a break uh, uh, for, uh, for a coffee, we have time for Questions if any from the audience. Okay. Um, what's, the, me, what's the scope of alternative indexing just in terms of you know, considering that the, the, the world market is market cap weighted kind of by default? I mean, that's sort of the way that the assets out there is the market cap weight, right? So, how far can you drift from that, just in terms of capacity? I mean, it's a very fair point to make, and that's also why it was, would be illusionary to say that we shouldn't invest in NCAP, or we should get rid of NCAP. NCAP is going to be, continue to be a large part of the investing assets. Uh, for instance, take, for example, an equal weight index. You cannot, as an asset, you cannot all start allocating towards equal weight. Or if you were to do it, then of course, equal weight would be the new NCAP, so to say. So there are capacity constraints. Uh, there are issues that we need to look, up, look upon, but at the end of the day, for most investors, these capacity constraints are not that important. A lot of, you know, we talk about the, about the largest, largest investor out there, we can allocate three or four of these data categories. 
But still, uh, it, is, uh, it is an issue. I don't have any number because I don't think there is a number that we can find to it. I guess the really any question is how, you know, how big do you have to be? Is there, can you be too big for this to be, you know, a, sort of a, a, an unachievable approach, unrealistic approach? Which approach? Well, it, 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 the, sort of the non-market the non cap approach. I mean, if you are a, a very large principal, I'm just trying to get an idea of size. No, 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 definitely. I mean, there are issues, but if we're looking for something, we take fundamental interesting principles, which is probably the, the most famous one out there. Um, they are quite closely related to MCAT, and I think they are allocated in some kind of, sort of like 75 billion allocated to kind of the industry today, and I think that if you pay for that money, you are going to be Minimum variance is, is more down to what restrictions you put on yourself. If you do the unconstrained minimum variance, you will have quite, quite a few capacity constraints, quite a lot of capacity constraints. But that, you can as well talk about if you apply them these assumptions and constraints in the portfolio, and then you can steer the capacity that you can invest in the spectrum for you. Other questions? Is it the minimum? What about the correlation? How to manage a recorrelation problem? Eventual correlation problem between a uh, different credit the drivers. Now, definitely, I think that is just one of the, 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 main, the main points that we're trying to make was that none of these things may tell the whole grade. Uh, and, and as long as we don't know what the market environment is going to be tomorrow, we're not going to know which one's going to perform the best. But what we also know is that the correlation structure will change over time. So instead, instead of trying to uh, put all the money into one, one kind of environment or one kind, kind of the correlation structure, we're saying we have to diversify across these different factors. So we are less reliant upon to say, get the, let's say, the correlation structure of sector lines. <coughs> that is one of, one of the main points that we, we're not there enough to, to say that we can time this, to say that this one is better than that one, and say, yes, diversify, and then we, the, then trying to ride the storm as smoothly as possible, also when there are correlation structures going up or going down. So, thank you very much, Daniel. If there are no more questions, I invite you downstairs for the coffee break. Just please be back 11.40 sharp uh, for the panel. Thank you very much. <laughs>